So you might have heard of anthrax, I thought. You might have heard of botulism, that's a food poisoning. Um, e. coli, you know, our Lake Lansing gets shut down because of E. coli counts from time to time. Those um, bacteria actually live in our intestines. Um, so today we're going to talk about different types of cells. For those of you who are um, note takers, you might choose to go back and watch that video again. I'll link it to the Google Classroom. Those of you who are asking what can I do to study, um, I think this online version, we don't really do a lot of studying because we're so focused on just getting assignments done that we kind of forget about doing something with the information. So that video is something you could do to go back and review. We want to be able to differentiate between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We want to be able to differentiate between the different groups of cells. We want to be able to compare and contrast animals and plants. So as you watch that video, they had blurbs of characteristics for each of those. And it might be too fast for you to write it down all at once, but you could always review it, pause, and write down your notes. And that gives you a really good study tool, I think, um, for those different groups. So um, just a reminder, moving on into our agenda here, uh, works from chapter one and six are no longer accepted. We're done with that information. We've updated our late policy to 10% a day. Most of us are doing a really good job, um, I think the last two weeks of getting information in. Um, and then this is something new. I'm going to offer retake or makeup test if somebody is yet missing the test next Friday during flex time. Um, I've showed you how to get into the portal to see your scores on that test. I need to um, release the test questions yet, so I'll try to do that. When we, when we get out of Zoom today, I'll release those test questions so you can go back and look and see um, what you got wrong on the test. Uh, with test retakes, I give up to 85% of a score. So if you scored below 85% and you want to try to do better, you can spend the next week reviewing that information that you didn't quite have the first time around. And then um, join me in the Zoom next week and you can uh, do another try at that test. Um, so today we're going to talk about different types of cells. In flex, you're going to label some plant and animal cells and turn those in today. Remember, same day turn in is by 3.30. Um, you'll have an hour after we get out of Zoom. You should be able to finish um, those labeling components. And then you're actually going to have homework this week. Um, so out of the textbook, you're going to read section 7.3, which is about the organelles. And I have an organelle table that I've put in Google Classroom for you to fill out while you're reading. Okay, so um, a reminder on where our textbook is. So if I go to our um, fourth hour, fifth hour, they're, they're set up the same. If I go to fifth hour and I go to classwork, the um, textbook is kind of moving down because every time I add a new week of information, it gets further down. So the textbook, click that, and there you go. These are the chapters we've done so far. Um, so we want to click on chapter seven, and we're going to go to section seven three. I'm almost there. Um, so this is section seven three. I looked for a page number, but I didn't see a page number 180. So 179 is the page you're going to start on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what you're going to do with that, let's go to week seven. You've done this CK 12 already. Um, <laughs> so it's in there somewhere. I'll make it more obvious for you, but you'll have this table to fill out. So as you read, write down the name of a structure. You can either diagram or insert an image from the internet identify its function and what type of 
organisms would have these structures. So that's what we're working on as a comparison right now. Okay, so I will look through that, make that more obvious as to where it's located. It might have gotten put in the wrong week or something. Um, ah, see, it didn't even get put in a week. I just realized. So um, it's called cellular organelles. There's the book and there's the assignment. Okay, um, after our Zoom, you're going to do this labeling of plants and animal cells. It's um, scaffolded. So the first piece here is like you're looking at what a cell and its parts look like. The next step, now you're going to try to label it being given a, a word bank. And then the next step, we're going to take the word bank away and see if you can still label it. So it's pretty repetitive and it kind of holds your hand right through it. And then you're going to do the animal cells. So this one you're going to turn in today. Um, this one, this one, you're going to turn in by Tuesday next week. Okay. So what questions do you have on our agenda? I am struggling to get to the right slides. Any questions on our agenda? We're going to go a little bit long today in the zoom, but you'll still have time to get that labeling done. Um, we're going to have activity during the Zoom, but we're also going to go a little bit further maybe than we typically would because we're going to do a little bit of catch up. We're a week behind, um, so we're going to gain a day here today. Okay. So in your Google Classroom, you will find today's lecture, types of cells, and you're also going to have this self check that we're going to do along the way. Okay, so starting with today's lecture. So we're talking about all the different types of cells. And um, this kind of gives us just an evolutionary background of our cells. So the oldest cells that we know of are bacteria. They're categorized into big groups. So we have the domain bacteria, the domain RK bacteria, and the domain eukarya. So these two are the prokaryotes that you've read about. These are the eukaryotes that you've read about. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the cells of each of these different types of organisms. So we're gonna talk about the cell itself, identify the two different types of cells, identify examples, characteristics, um, and we're gonna talk about the endosymbiotic theory. So you should know, those of you who are note takers, write this sentence down. A cell is the functional and structural unit of all living things. You found that in your cell theory. You read about the cell theory in the CK12. So by definition, it's the structural functional unit of all living things. Um, cells were probably first seen by Anton van Leeuwenhoek in 1632. I'm not gonna ask you that. Um, it's just some background history. He would uh, study all kinds of things. And then uh, 19, or 1663, Robert Hooke gave it its name. So cell came from the Latin word small room. And our two big types of cells are either prokaryotes or eukaryotes. So the prokaryotes have two categories, bacteria and archaebacteria. The more formal name is eubacteria and RK bacteria. RK is ancient, U is true. Then we have our eukaryotic cells, those with a nucleus. And these are the groups, protists, fungi, plants, animals. Most of your protists are single-celled. Most of these are multi-celled. So you could very easily in your notebook, if you were taking notes, you might start a concept map. So you got all types of cells, then branch, prokaryote, eukaryote. You can continue to branch giving your examples, showing the relationship between them, okay? Then we're gonna talk about each one. So on your branching, you bacteria, RK bacteria, you can then write about each of those. I know I have a tendency to talk fast. You can always go back through the PowerPoint at your own pace. Take time to write those things down. You can watch the video back um, I know I've, I'm behind on a couple of the videos here. It actually takes a while to, to take care of those. And when I come to school, that video doesn't go with me. So I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna try to get caught up on those today. So here we're gonna talk about the prokaryotes. Pro is first or before. 
like you go to the pro shop before you go golfing. Perio is referring to kernel, which is referring to the nucleus. So it's before the nucleus it comes from Greek. A lot of our science comes from like science words come from Greek or Latin. So here's characteristics of prokaryotes. They are all unicellular. They all lack membrane bound nuclei and organelles. So they have just the big cell membrane surrounded by a cell wall and a capsule. Inside they have cytoplasms and ribosomes. So there's things they don't have and there's things they do have. That is true of both the eukaryote, I'm sorry, the eubacteria and the RK bacteria. They also have circular DNA. Unlike ours, our DNA is linear and they have one circular DNA chromosome. So chemically they're the same. Um, the DNA is just structurally they're different. So this is what a typical prokaryotic cell would look like. No nucleus, though all the DNA is found in a general region called the nucleoid. Okay, we can see three layers, a cell membrane, just like our cells have a cell membrane, a cell wall, though it's not made of cellulose like plants, and a capsule. You can see they have um, some structures special for movement, flagella, pili. Eubacteria, <clears throat> so I've taken that prokaryote and I've divided it into eubacteria and archaebacteria, comes from the word small stick. It's the most abundant organism on earth. And this is because it can be found anywhere and they reproduce every 20 minutes. So there's a lot of them. They're found in the soil, they're found in your gut, they're found on your skin. They are found If you don't move for 20 or 30 minutes, our lights go off now. Um, so they can be found anywhere, which makes them very common. Many of them are pathogens. Pathogens mean disease causing. Um, so you're familiar with, we just talked about botulism and anthrax, for example, um, but many are also beneficial. So um, like vitamin or E. coli manufactures vitamin K in our intestines. So that's a good thing. Um, you have a lot of bacteria that are on the surface of your skin that act to um, protect you against foreign bacteria that are not good for you. Um, their cell wall, I told you it wasn't made of cellulose, but it's made of peptidoglycan. I want you to think about that word, and I'm going to open up my chat box and see if I can't get some guesses as to what kind of macromolecules, that was our last chapter, right? What kind of macromolecules do you think make up peptidoglycan? So throw it in the chat based off of that word. Peptid makes you think of what? Glycan makes you think of what? What do those words remind you of from our four macromolecules last chapter? Sophia's got us started. Yeah, peptides. So we know it's made of some sort of protein. And what do you think the other half is, gang? Glycan. What other words did we talk about last chapter? We don't leave a chapter behind. We continue to build off of it. Glucose, glycogen, what were they? What category of macromolecules were they? Yeah, thank you, Isabel. They were carbohydrates, right. So this peptidoglycan is a combination of peptides and carbohydrates, okay? Another characteristic of eubacteria is they reproduce asexually from binary fission, so they simply split in half. So we had our category of prokaryotes and we divided it. We talked about the eubacteria, now we're going to talk about the RK bacteria. RK is ancient. Here's a bunch of those. They have such crazy shapes. You got spirils, you got bacils, you got caucus, which are circles. So the name comes from Greek old one. It wasn't identified until 1977. So all bacteria used to be in one category, one kingdom, Monera. And then in 1977, they found these other, these bacteria actually have a different structure than the other bacteria. So instead of peptidoglycan in the cell walls, they have the pseudomerian. You don't ever have to tell me that word. Just know that their cell wall is not made of peptidoglycan. So once that was discovered, they were taken out of the kingdom and placed into their own group, their own domain. 
are K. So these are the extremo files. File comes from philic, which is attracted to. So they're attracted to extreme conditions. So what kind of extreme conditions? Halophiles, halite. Anybody know what halite is? It's salt in a rock form. So these live in very salty areas. You've heard of the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea is believed to not have any living organisms in it because it has such a high salinity, high salt content. However, we do know now that halophiles are found there. Thermophiles, thermo refers to heat. So like the geysers um, or volcanic vents where there's a lot of heat, you're gonna find these thermophiles. And the final one is methanogens. Methanogens um, are chemosynthesizers. They use um, inorganic molecules to make their food and energy. Methane is a gaseous um, product of decomposition. So these are found like in swamps, swampy areas. Okay, um, so that's the RK bacteria. A little bit of background here. So way back when, four and a half billion years ago, and it's hard to even fathom what a billion years is, but way back when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So that means our bacteria did not use oxygen. They were anaerobic. An is not or without. Air is referring to the oxygen. So not or without oxygen. So these organisms, um, they produce their energy without the use of oxygen, which is not terribly efficient. Then along came some photosynthesizing bacteria. So just some random mutation in the genetic code allowed them to absorb sunlight and create energy and food. So they started creating energy from the sun. And along with that, what did they create? What do photosynthesizers create? How do they benefit us, those synthesizers? How is it going to change the atmosphere here? What did the photosynthetic bacteria do? Voices, come on. You can put it. Yeah, thank you so much. I like to not be alone here. Um, so they started producing oxygen. So now there's oxygen that's in the atmosphere. Some of these anaerobic bacteria can't handle oxygen. They'll actually die in the presence of oxygen. So they started dying off. And then um, we can see that we started to develop aerobic bacteria along around two and a half billion years ago. So again, mutations, certain organisms are able to do different things. So these organisms were able to take the oxygen and make energy from that. So that was a benefit to them. So then it's believed those cells combined with other cells to form our first eukaryotic cells about 1.5 billion years ago. So how did those eukaryotic cells come to be? That is the endosymbiotic theory. So here we can see the host bacteria and some other bacterium. So maybe this is um, one of those aerobic bacteria that can use the oxygen. This cell ate it, but didn't digest it. They're gonna live symbiotically. They're living together. Now this aerobic or bacteria is able to make energy for its host cell. So this is believed to be how we got our mitochondria. So the mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria makes energy for our cells. Next, we have those photosynthesizing bacteria we mentioned. Same thing. They were engulfed by a non-photosynthetic bacterium. That photosynthetic bacteria now can make food for the cell that has engulfed it. So they're living, living symbiotically in that sense. And so this is believed to be how we got our chloroplast. So mutually beneficial, the inside bacterium has a protection from its environment, but it's doing something for its outer host. It's either making energy or it's making food. So that leads us into the eukaryotic cells because now we're starting to get organelles. Um, the evidence behind this theory has to do with a few key features. One, they have their own DNA. 
And like bacteria, that chromosome is in a circular form rather than linear, okay? Here's our organelles, here's our prokaryotes. So they are alike and unlike us. We haven't talked about histones yet, we'll get into those later on, but basically it's DNA wrapped around proteins. And so there aren't, isn't that wrapping in the prokaryote or the mitochondria chloroplast, but there is in our cells. Ribosomes that make proteins, all organisms have to have ribosomes because proteins, they men like they control all of our cellular functions basically. Um, so their size, let's just refer to this as their size, is 70 and ours is 80. So the mitochondria and chloroplasts, just like the bacteria. And again, they reproduce independently of our cells. They go through binary fission, they simply split in half and become two new cells, which is totally different than how our cells do it. So all of these characteristics are the same as a prokaryote. So it does seem to be a earlier prokaryote that had been engulfed by cells. So you should be able to identify the evidence behind the endosymbiotic theory, and you should relate it to mitochondria and chloroplast specifically. So recognize that they are replicating independently. They have their own DNA, so they are independent of the parent cell. Any questions so far? We are gonna pause for station identification. Okay, I showed you that you had this self-check right here. So I'm gonna give you a handful of minutes. We're gonna get this done while we're in Zoom and turn it in today for points. So I want you, I'm gonna give you five minutes to work on the first two slides, okay? So five minutes are on the board. Ready, set, go. You have your, you should have your very own copy. Am I wrong about that? Oh, I am wrong about that, aren't I? Shoot. Where did my classroom go?
clearly not going to be 100 points, but I'll adjust all of that later. So I put a new one up, self-check. So if you open that, you should be able to type on it. GERD. Yeah, some of you may have made a copy for yourself. If not, I just put an editable one in for you. Thank you for those of you who just jumped right on it. So if you weren't able to make a copy of the one I made, I did create a new one for you to use. So it's um, just labeled self-check here now. When we do self checks, that's basically like these are things you're going to need to know come test day. So we're making sure you got it. Should be our order. So let's check in, shall we? Um, differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Jonathan, can you help me out? How are the two groups different? Um, so one has a cell membrane. Well, they both have cell membranes. Oh. Um, like, uh, one is, one is mainly multicellular. Which one? Uh, euchre, eukarya, eukarya. Okay. Um, 
So when you when you're on a test and you want to answer that question, a lot of times people do say one is this and one is that, and it doesn't tell me that you know it. So on the test, you want to say like bacteria or the prokaryotes are mostly unicellular and the eukaryotes are mostly multicellular. Whatever your comparison is, always identify which is which. So Todd, can you give me another difference between the two? You're muted, huh? I can't hear you. Okay, I'll try the chat. Okay, thanks. Brand Braden is throwing one out for us. Eukaryotes have a nucleus, prokaryotes don't. I'm being short. And Sarkaz, do you have a voice? Yeah, I didn't. Let's try that again. No, you don't have a voice. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go with another one from the chat. So we also have no organelles versus organelles. So if you were writing this, you would write eukaryote and prokaryote. I'm just being short. The first one was the you, the pro in the second one's you. Um, so comparing them, how are they similar? Jonathan already gave us one. He said they both have cell membranes. What else can you say is true of both of them, Isabel? Um, they both have a ribosomes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, they also both have cytoplasm. Um, they're both examples of cells, any of those. I'm gonna skip the examples. I think you guys can figure those out for sure on your own. Oh. Um, what are the three domains? I didn't realize I skipped this one. How about Evan? Did you get the three domains? I didn't mean for that to be loud. Can you give me any of the three? Mr. O'Mara? Okay, from the chat box, I got you bacteria and RK bacteria. And from our worksheet right below us, we're given a little bit hint here. And that we have you bacteria again, not a you, eukarya. Okay, I'm not gonna do examples, but the kingdom. So eukarya, branch, 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 right? Um, branches into some kingdoms. Miranda, can you give me some kingdoms? Um, animalis. Animalia. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Oh, me? Sure. Oh, I wrote this down somewhere. What um, is it? Like well, there's the There was a plant one. Uh-huh, plantae. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, I feel like there was something like EUB. That was the U bacteria, so that's up here. What would you call like mushroom? Oh, yeah. Call you know, what? Mushroom. Why they mushroom? Oh, mushroom fungi. To the party because he's a fungi. Right. And then the other one is probably the one we're least familiar with. It's the protus. I'll let you guys come up with examples. Okay. So normally we would stop here, but like I said, we're extending today to try to like get a day back from our backlog. So I'm gonna keep pushing forward. You guys are gonna wanna come back and finish that if you didn't already finish it. Um, so that was our division between the eukaryote and the prokaryote. So 
so last we talked, we had made eukaryotes out of the endosymbiotic theory. So now let's talk about the eukaryote in particular. So characteristics of the eukaryote. So just like I asked you some characteristics of bacteria, you're going to want to be able to give me characteristics of eubacteria or eukaryote, sorry. Um, so they're unicellular or multicellular. Majority multicellular, fungi, plants, and animals, even though yeast is a unicellular um, fungi. Protists, protozoans, algae, that, that's all part of the unicellular group. Um, they do have a membrane-bound organelle and membrane-bound nuclei. So that's the big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Got it? We talked about the linear DNA. So you guys are picturing a Venn diagram here, right? The linear DNA for um, eukaryotes, whereas the bacteria has the circular DNA. So this is what a typical eukaryote would look like. We're just talking the basics. Tonight, you're gonna to go and look at some specific structures. So here's the first category. Our first kingdom is protists. So this is a euglena, an amoeba, a paramecium, an algae. These are all examples of protozoans if they are motile, if they can move. They're zoo-like. Um, they feed by phagocytosis, so they engulf, like that endosymbiotic theory, and digest inside. Algae belong to the plant-like protists, um, and they can photosynthesize. They all have chloroplasts. These guys have chloroplasts too. Um, the protists to me is like the hodgepodge. They're animal-like, they're plant-like, they're unicellular, they're multicellular. Some make food, some don't. It's like, I feel like it's the organisms that don't fit into any other category. Some move, some don't. Here's the fungus. So fungus could be multicellular or unicellular. So like these are multicellular penicillin, multicellular um, would be mold or fung um, mushroom. And then we have some unicellular over here. This would be athlete's foot, deuteromyces. Um, so they're thought to be more like animals than plants. I believe that was a question in your CK12 review. They're mostly symbiotic, meaning they don't live alone. They live in relation to other organisms. These are decomposers, just you find on bread mold. Um, they lack organs, and they reproduce some sexually and some asexually. So some all by themselves and others need other cells. Many are used in everyday human life, like we use these for antibiotics. We eat these and these. This we don't like. <laughs> You're going to label some plants and animal cells today. So you're going to look at the big, big structures. Cell wall made of cellulose. We talked about that in the macromolecule chapter. Cellulose, polysaccharides. So we keep building off of what we learned. We don't learn a chapter and then leave it. Okay. Um, so unlike the bacterial cell walls of peptidoglycan, unlike the walls of the fungi, which was chitin. They have this large central vacuole that's unique to plants. They do undergo photosynthesis because they have these chloroplasts here that contain chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll, these right here, um, this is your chloroplast. And then inside these thylakoids, we're gonna find a pigment. Pigments absorb different wavelengths of light and reflect others. So they're able to absorb the sunlight and make energy. So those of you who are my note takers, these are the things that you're gonna put in your category. These are the things that you're gonna put on a flashcard. Here's my flashcard of animal cells, blah, 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 blah. My flashcard of plant cells, blah, 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 right? So you guys can start organizing your thoughts each day. So these are our multicellular animals. They don't have a cell wall, so that's a big difference with plants. They don't have chloroplasts. They have small vacuoles rather than large vacuoles. So we use our vacuoles more like packaging um, components. They appear spherical in shape rather than boxy. And they have a variety of organelles such as lysosomes. Lysosome is for digesting things. And centrioles, which are used for cell division. 
So those are structures that plants don't have. So today we're just identifying all the uniqueness of these cells. Cells come in all variety of shapes and sizes. The smallest cell, like smaller than a bacterium, the largest cell, you can see an egg. When you make breakfast, you're eating a single cell. So they come in lots of different sizes, lots of different shapes. Their shape determines their function. This is a big biological concept, okay? These guard cells, they control the opening and closing of um, this gas pore, let's just say that, for plants. They let CO2 in and O2 out. And when they don't wanna lose mo moisture, they fill up and they close. So this shape allows them to kind of act like a balloon and close that space, very specific. Nerve cells have to reach from your spinal cord to your toes needs to have very long extensions to get that information there. Paramecium, they um, live in the water and they have all these little cilia here, which pushes food into this gullet. So the structure performs the function, right? The red blood cells have to go through um, vessels. So the circular shape, very functional. Um, onion cells, layer, 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 layer. Many cell layers thick allows for um, additional storage and also like um, you can lose layers. So this is how for us cell specialization occurs. We have a single cell and we form stem cells. You've heard of stem cells. We'll talk more about these in mitosis. That stem cell gets a signal and it becomes one of four secondary stem cells. At this point, they're kind of committed to a certain lineage of cells. So this can become any one of, we have a number of different types of nerve cells. This is mesenchymal cells. They can become bone, they can become cartilage, they can become ligaments and tendons. So it's committed to a certain line. These are gonna become any type of blood cell, white blood cell, red blood cell, okay? So it just keeps differentiating more and more depending on the signals it receives from our body. We can see all these shapes are very different. Um, cells that are in our cheeks and in our intestines, for example, are going to be very thin and they're gonna occur in a number of layers because there's a lot of friction. So they lose cells every day. Um, our T cells are fighting cancer daily and winning. So we never know that that cancer cell is there. And then skin cells. If you got the right stem cell, you can grow anything. So it's kind of cool. If you were to lose an ear in an accident, you would want to be able to replace it. You don't care that it's grown underneath the, that skin. It's kind of fun. Okay. So another five minutes on the next bit of self-check. So we got another self-check and you saw how I was calling on people. So you wanna be a little bit prepared, right? I'll give you five minutes to work that out. Think about the information right after it's given to you. Think about it again later on in the day. That's how we start to form memories. We just listen to it once, it's probably not gonna sink in. We gotta do something with it. Okay. What was the big difference between RK bacteria and U bacteria? How about Kara? Do you remember a big difference between them? Yeah, what makes the wall? So, um, the RK bacteria don't have peptidoglycan and U bacteria do. The other difference I think is maybe just where they're found. So the RK can live where the others can't. I'm gonna let you guys do the summary. Oh yeah, good, 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 good. And then um, what would be two things that support the endosymbiotic theory? I realize these are a little bit out of order. Um, Gabby, I don't know if we've heard from you yet. What could you, if, if you wanted to support this endosymbiotic theory that mitochondria were once bacteria, what could you use to support that? And this one in particular? So you'll need to, you want to spend some time going back and digesting it, right? Take time. Um, but let's go back up just for this one right here. 
So these are the things that are true of bacteria. And these are the things that are true of mitochondria and chloroplasts. So I could list any of these as evidence okay. because they're more like the prokaryote than they are like our cells. So the DNA shape is different. The ribosome size is different. Their reproduction is different. So any one of those I could put here. And if you were summarizing the endosymbiotic theory, you would just take this information here and you would talk about it. So again, just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna throw that picture there. So I would talk about one cell engulfing another cell. Okay. Um, so two common characteristics among all eukaryotic cells. So this is a little bit easier. What do they all have? Evan, let me hear your voice. Evan O'Mara. All eukaryotic cells have what? There you go. Uh, they all have nuclei. Yes, they do. That's the big, big thing, right? They also have what, Riley? Or R. They could be R, have, do. What would be common with all eukaryotic cells? So um, these are characteristics of eukaryotes. So it looks like this is not common to all. It looks like they all have this. They all have this. And they all have this. So I could say any of those, and it would be true, okay? They're not all unicellular, they're not all multicellular, but they all have nucleus, organelles, and linear DNA. So any of those would work, okay? Um, here's the relationship between a cell's form and its function. What's the relationship, Ellie? Yeah. It's important to know which which causes which, right? So structure determines function. Huge um, underlying theme of biology. You did pretty awesome at the volleyball game yesterday, by the way. You really slammed the ball. Thank you. <laughs> I liked your celebration as well. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so if we're gonna do a claim evidence reasoning. You make a claim, you have to state evidence. The reasoning, so this is the piece I think a lot of us are working on yet. The reasoning is explaining why that evidence supports the claim. So the claim is, I'm gonna, normally I would ask you, but I'm just gonna tell you, a virus is not a living organism. What's the evidence? What do they not do? And we actually have talked about this in an earlier chapter. What do they not do or they, that allows me to say they're not living. Sophia, I haven't heard from you yet today. Would you be able to tell me anything that viruses don't do? Virus, um... Or they aren't, or they're not, any of that. They don't? Um, no, they don't. Feeding wasn't um, one of them. We did have metabolism. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, that's fine. So they don't have a metabolism, maybe? So then here we would want to explain why you have to have a metabolism to be considered a living thing. Would you be able to make a connection with that? Or you could go off of your feeding. So if they don't have a metabolism, that means that they can't... Um, I was gonna say grow, but they do grow and mutate. They don't grow. They don't grow? Right. Okay. Okay, so then we might refer back to the eight characteristics of living things. If they don't meet all eight characteristics, then they wouldn't be considered a living thing. So I could put anything in here that they don't, that is true of the eight characteristics. They don't reproduce. They're not made of cells. So I could throw any of those characteristics there and then just explain why that means they're not living. Okay. So we filled out most of it after you guys had a chance to do it together. There's a few blanks for you to go back and make sure are finished before you turn it in. But you're ready to turn this one in then. Okay. So that should be turned in. I'll be in the next 10 minutes. Do it while it's fresh in your head, right? So we're working with information. 
And then you're going to do your labeling of the cell. You probably will get that done before flax. And then do the notes over the weekend. Take a break after you've done your labeling and come back to the note taking, okay? So what questions do you have for me now? 